All right, everyone, welcome back to the STOA, uh, part three in uh, Sebastian Marshall's Philosopher in Residence series here at the STOA. Uh, the series was uh, originally called Industrial Philosophy, but uh, we decided to rename it to Bespoke Applied Science. Um, it feels like that that maps over to what uh, Sebastian uh, is uh, offering here, uh, meeting reality where it's at, uh, where you're at, um in order to become more wise in this complex world uh and this is a really fun series really practical series hyper practical series and uh, sebastian is definitely a philosopher uh to teach this skill um so i'm going to tag in uh, sebastian today and uh, we're here for about uh 60 90 minutes um and he'll set the protocols so sebastian my friend welcome back to the stoa thanks peter so as a housekeeping note, um, a lot of my uh, my notes and materials were put together under the title Industrial Philosophy, right? So if it's your first time here, I wanted to draw a distinction um, between people that do things for, for just like a sheer theoretical, like let's try to understand things, and for people that have like a lot of um, kind of impetus, a lot of necessity to make things really practical. You see a lot of the best work done by people in philosophy were done by people that, um, you know, were in some type of industry where they had to actually solve hard, difficult problems. And when you try to solve a hard, difficult problem, whether you're an engineer or you're in finance or, you know, you're a military officer, right? You can have like what you think is a great idea and then you turn out to be badly wrong and it could be like put you in a very bad spot and be very dangerous. And I think that carries over into sharpening your thinking in other domains right? Even as you think about like, what's a great life? You know what I mean? If you're thinking about like, what's a great life, but it's like very theoretical, you don't put anything into practice, right? Then like, how do you know if you're right or not? But if you're like, hey, let's make a very safe car or very safe train, and your train comes literally off the tracks, literally as a railroad designer, it comes literally off the tracks and it crashes, you're like, whoa, we got some math wrong or some engineering wrong or some safety protocols wrong. Like we thought that was good. It wasn't good right? And it gives you a sort of like a humility and it gives you a lot of tools to solve problems that then when you go back and you think about like, okay, like what's a great life? How do people work well together? How does society get along with each other? Um, I think it gives you a humility and it gives you an ability to take these like very practical tools from things like how do we make a railroad safe? How do we do something in engineering? How do we keep our troops safe if we're fighting a war and take over the enemy capital or whatever the, the what we think is the winning conditions of that conflict? Um, you learn in those contexts how to think where the, there's a lot of humility and high stakes and you could be wrong. You bring that back to like, what's a great life? Um, and I think it goes well. So I wanted to highlight a number of thinkers and I also want to make this very, very practical, right? So the first one we talked about this general concept. Last time we talked about how to actually put numbers on things, how to look at statistics, statistical calibration, um, you know, meteorologists, people that, that predict the weather. They could be right or wrong, and it's statistical, right? And it's not like, is it going to rain on Monday or not? It's what are the odds it's going to rain? And some of it's well calibrated. If they say there's an 80% chance of rain, and they make that prediction 100 times, around 80 times it will rain and 20 times it won't. And so we talked about statistical calibration last time, some very practical tools around that. One of the reasons it's hard to think very, very clearly, one of the reasons it's hard to think very, very clearly about reality um, is because reality is like very, very, very complex um, and messy, right? And a lot of times for something that we want to talk about or explore or do, a lot of times there's like a million things. So if you're looking at like, hey, what would be a great job for me? What would be a great career? What would be like a good hobby to take up? Where do I want to live? Uh, should I get married to this person and that sort of thing? These are like very, very complex decisions. You know, you might meet somebody um, that's like really fun, really cool, really understands you is like not so organized or, you know, maybe has bad habits financially. And it's like, what do I do there? <laughs> you know what I mean? And these are like super practical questions that people think about. One of the things we're going to do is today is we're going to sharpen our skills a little bit around analysis, which is a fancy word for taking things apart, and synthesis, which is like a fancy word for putting things back together. Um, and we'll start with some easy stuff and then get into some harder stuff, right? So first thing we want to do, I want to talk a little bit about this guy, John Boyd. 
And um, we'll look at one of the ways he presented analysis and synthesis. I'm really just fascinated by people that get really good at a few different unrelated disciplines and put them together. And I think that's where a lot of the great thinking comes in the world, right? So John Boyd was a, a US military officer. He was a fighter pilot in the Air Force, and he was apparently a really good fighter pilot. He was kind of born at like a funny moment where he was um, too young to go fight in, in World War II and just like barely was um, getting up to speed as, a, as an Air Force um, airman uh, when the Korean War was winding down. And then there was a, a period of relative peace until Vietnam. So he kind of missed a lot of the combat. He was a more of a peacetime officer, but he did a lot of great theory. After already getting started successfully down the fighter pilot track, he went back and got an engineering degree and he worked on something called energy maneuverability theory. Uh, which is still used in modern aircraft design today, both civilian and military. So this is a guy that was like able to fly planes and like dogfight versus, you know, Russian MiGs or whatever. And then he's like, well, how do airplanes work in general? How does like turning on an airplane work at different speeds and, and different energy levels? Worked out the equations on that bunch of calculus um, and mathematics and then applied that as design principles. He went into doing like aircraft design and a little bit of military strategy. And then later in his life, he was like, what predicts like society going well? teams working together, people getting stronger over time instead of weaker. How do people think? How do we perceive? How do we even take information? Super interesting guy, highly recommended. We're going to pull out just like one thing from him today, which is we're going to talk about a concept that was written up by Franz Osinga. A bunch of people study studied Boyd because he's a fascinating guy. And we want to use analysis and synthesis, right? So one of the things that Boyd did, and I'm going to encourage you to actually do this, is he would say, I want you to join me in a mental exercise. I want you to think about this, right? And so he says, hey, imagine you're on a ski slope with other skiers, right? So you can actually like pause for a second. It's kind of a cool thing about being human is you could like think about something that's either happened to you or, or, or that you have or have not experienced. Imagine you're on a ski slope with other skiers. So you got skis on, you got the poles, your ski slope. Okay, cool. Now set that picture aside for a second. Imagine you're in Florida. You're on a boat. It's got an outboard motor on it. It's like an engine, right? Motorboat. Maybe there's water skiers behind you. Okay, then think for a second about a bicycle. On a spring day, you're riding a bicycle. You know, there's the, the, the pedals, the wheels, so on, bicycle. And then imagine that, you know, you're a parent and you take your son to a department store and you notice he's fascinated by like a little toy tank with uh, tank treads on it. All right. Now, pull these pieces out of the context they're originally from. Take the skis off, pair of skis, but you're not on a ski slope. You got a pair of skis. Right? Skis. You can actually imagine this, right? Right? Skis. Ski slope skis. Take the engine off the boat. Take a standard engine off a boat. No Florida, not in the ocean. Just you have an engine. So now you got a pair of skis and an engine. From the bicycle, take the handlebars off the bicycle. Throw the rest of the bike away. Throw the gears away. Throw the wheels away. Whatever. Just the handlebars on a bike. Right? And then take the rubber treads off of the toy tank. So that gives you the following pieces, skis, outboard motor, handlebars, rubber treads. What can you do when you put all that together? Give a shot if you want. What can you do with that? There you go. Cool. That was fast. That was fast. I will pull this back up. That was fast. So yeah, he says, actually sit and think through this, right? You could take skis off the skiing thing, the boat off of the thing, right? Skier, bicycler, engine, tank tread. Take those pieces from the context they're in, and then you can put them together and get that. So you actually think about snowmobile, right? Snowmobile is a relatively late technology um, after all these other pieces were invented, right? And what's a snowmobile? Like these things work pretty good in the snow, right? This thing is pretty good for generating power. This thing is pretty good for steering. This thing um, is pretty good for, for going through uneven surfaces on a heavy device, right? So this thing lets the thing drive forwards. That thing lets it like actually steer so it doesn't get bogged down in the snow. You drive forward and you can steer it with that. It's pretty cool, right? So a lot of what we're going to be doing in life is the equivalent of that, right? We're going to try to take pieces apart and 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 put them back together. And 
what I believe is that in very, very many cases, not all cases, but very, very many cases, you could do this to do really interesting, cool stuff with your life. You probably, most people probably don't think about it this way, but when you move into a new apartment and you're thinking about setting up a kitchen or an office space, you know, a lot of people during COVID had to do work from home setups. You're actually pulling pieces out and saying, hey, like, what did I have in the office that was cool? Right. So like, hey, in the office, I had like a dedicated space uh, where I could work. I had a coffee machine. It was very fast to get coffee. Um, you know, there were uh, cleaners that came through and dumped the trash and stuff. So I could just throw the trash into this like big bin if we had food or snacks or whatever. And there were food and snacks. And you can kind of go through that and you can like replicate as many of those um, as you want to. And as would be useful for you by thinking about the pieces. And you can also say like, which of these are very hard to replicate? Okay, like the socializing aspect of just like randomly meeting people in the office is very hard to replicate, right? We noticed that in particular, the, the random socializing, bumping into somebody in the office when you had five minutes was hard to replicate, right? One of the things we did is we set up um, over, over at Ultra Working internally, uh, we set up um, a couple of different chat apps where you could just see who's online and just like kind of wave at them and just like have an impromptu social conversation. Worked okay. Didn't work as good as we like, but we tried to make it so that people could get that, hey, I got five, 10, 20 minutes between something I just want to riff with somebody sort of thing. And we've tried different ways to do that, right? Because in terms of the work from home setup, sure, you can get snacks, you can get like a quiet space, you could design things. There's like a dedicated desk area, potentially, if you have enough space, how do you get that impromptu social interaction? So like, what do we miss when we're working from home? That in particular, right? Because other people are involved, other people are presumably not in your home, right? So you can do this for very concrete items, and it's pretty straightforward that you could take these things out of the context that they're in and put them together. You can also study any context that you want to work with. I think you can also do this with abstract items, right? So this was a role we were, we were hiring for a little bit recently. And I think this can be applied, the general point of this can be applied to a lot of things, right? When you think about something very complex of like, would I like this job or should I go to graduate school, right? Uh, this isn't really amenable to just out of the box doing science on, right? Like, like there's no, like N equals one, you're just one person, you're going to do your life one time, presumably, right? So like, would I enjoy studying this or that? Should I go back to grad school? Should I take this job? It's very hard to do. But we can oftentimes take elements out of those decisions, right? And evaluate things based on the elements. We break things out of the context, doing analysis, and then we evaluate them. So it's very difficult. Like, hey, if you're, if you're hiring somebody, it's like, hey, would I like working with this person? Would they do good work? We created, these are from my notes on one particular person. There's like no identifying details here. Here's some of the categories we use. We, we have different ones that we use for different roles, but for this particular role, we saw these as all very relevant, right? We saw these as all very relevant. And what we do is we rank on a one, two, three, four scale. And I think we borrowed this from Amazon. I didn't originally set up this scale, but it works pretty well. When you set up a one, two, three, four scale when you're evaluating something, right? One is like strongly against or serious weakness, very, very bad. Two is like a little bit bad at this thing. Three is like a little bit good at it. Four is really, really good, right? So this candidate here, this uh, either this gentleman or this lady um, was seemingly like a slightly good, like, like good uh, communicator, dialogue partner. The follow through was like maybe a little bit below average, right? But the dependability was kind of high. That's kind of a weird mix. We could look at my notes and figure out why. Speed was a little bit down but like good design aesthetic and taste. The design aesthetic, I remember this one now. The design aesthetic was like not exactly a fit for us, right? So the person might like make really good stuff, but like we have like a particular style, right? You know, you could say that somebody that, um, you know, makes uh, like superhero comic books and somebody that's a designer for like BMW might both be great designers. And like, you might be a great designer of comic books, but you might not have the BMW style or vice versa, right? Um, and so we have these different things. Where I think this gets really, really interesting is you can create these sort of things you evaluate on that people understand. So we say, hey, roommate test. This is one we use for every single person that we think about working with is would the person be a good roommate, right? So that's a complex bunch of stuff, right? Like what's a great roommate, right? So if you like 
rent an apartment, there's another bedroom, and then you're going to bring in a roommate. So you're, you're dealing with landlord and all that sort of stuff, right? And you're trying to say, hey, would this be a good roommate? It's my call, right? Well, is that person going to get you the cash on time for you to pay the rent? Are they going to leave like dirty dishes in the sink? You know what I mean? Um, if they have people over and they're going to be a little loud and rowdy, do they tell you in advance and double check that nothing's going on important? Obviously, if they're fighting with their romantic partner and slamming doors and stuff, they'd be a terrible roommate. And if they're like not doing that, that's like much better, right? So we have the roommate test. Um, we have one that like points at a complex bunch of stuff, right? Is this person like adaptable? Are they calm under pressure? Can they work um, if conditions get a little rough? Can they like step in and do whatever? Are they like well composed? And are they like pleasant to be around? Even if we're doing something very challenging, we call it a zombie apocalypse test, right? So are we more likely to survive or get killed <laughs> if there's the, uh, you know, the fictional zombie apocalypse happens? right? And this person looks like they would be like a slightly bad roommate. Do you know what I mean? Like not terrible, but maybe they're leaving some dirty dishes out or otherwise being a little bit messy, uh, but they would be okay. If we're having a zombie apocalypse, they're going to be like pretty tough. They're not going to be the person that forgets to lock the door and the zombies just come through the door. They're not going to be the person that, uh, uh, you know, does something risky or, or foolish, right? We also put on their X factor. So this was a relatively late addition when we were hiring is Sometimes we'd put together a list of stuff and like we, we do some other stuff besides this is one small piece of what we do, right? This is just a way to evaluate kind of the general attributes uh, of something and then we can discuss it, right? Can a person think heavily about outcomes, not just like I'm doing the task, but like, hey, I want to get a result from this, right? And so we would have these on here and then eventually we realized like, yeah, you know, this person like scores like twos and threes only, but there's something about them that we like a lot eventually create a category called X factors or something really special, or unique or rare, you know, um, about this person, right? So, you know, if we were hiring somebody to do front end web development, right? And they had like, you know, some illustrious success in like writing poetry or like in theater or something. And we're like, I don't know, but there's like something really interesting about that that might work to this person's advantage. Somehow it might be cool to work with them somehow. Doesn't really fit anywhere else but there's some X factor there, right? We'll put that on there, right? So at the end of this, you can't just sum these up or average them, right? Because you might take somebody that's like four on a couple of things, two on a couple of things and threes. And you might even under rare circumstances, someone that's a lot of fours with one like critical weakness um, on something on one, um, you might want to work with them, right? So what this does is the ability to set things up like this, right? Let's you take extremely complicated decisions, extremely complex decisions that are like a big swirling mass of stuff. You know, if you're European, hey, should I live in Rotterdam or should I live in Berlin or should I live in Barcelona? Very, very, very different places, right? Very, very different places, right? Obviously, there's some similarities maybe between like Rotterdam and Berlin in some ways in terms of uh, the climate and the culture. On the other hand, in terms of like kind of like hip, interesting art city, maybe there's some similarities between Berlin and Barcelona, right? Maybe Barcelona and Rotterdam maybe seem the most far apart, maybe a little bit, but they've also, you know, both have a couple of interesting things about them. Um, if you speak Dutch or German or Spanish, that's probably different. If you don't speak any of those, the ability to get around in English varies a little bit in those places, a little bit, you could get by. You could create something like this to rank. Hey, you know, what do I think the chance of meeting people that are just like, like okay are? And like, what are the chances of meeting somebody that's like the best uh, in the world in my field who would be great mentors and inspiration? So you might say, hey, I'm like less likely to meet just like people I like to hang out with in Barcelona than Berlin for you and your life, the evaluation. But if you were like an architect and you wanted to meet like world, world, world-class people or get like top, top, top level inspiration, then maybe Barcelona is better than Berlin at that, right? So you can kind of put together these sorts of things abstractly. You just create them out of thin air. There's no actual zombie apocalypse test. Zombie apocalypses don't actually exist, but this lets us kind of assess reality, right? And different people, it's interesting, right? Like this is out of thin air. 
But it's interesting, different people converge on somewhat similar answers. It'd be extremely rare for people on our team for somebody to be like, yeah, this person would be an ace. If there's a zombie apocalypse, they'd be good at first aid. They're very conscientious. They're very cool under pressure. They're thoughtful towards people. They don't behave randomly or haphazardly. And someone else is like, no, they're a disaster. They'd get us killed. That wouldn't happen. The arguing is generally about around like three, four, two, three, one, two. Do you know what I mean? People do tend to cluster on the same answers. If people came to way different answers as to like whether someone's outcome focused, then that highlights it and it gets very, very interesting, right? So if somebody's like, hey, this person's not just like think about tasks, they think about outcomes. Someone's like, hey, four, I think they're really good at that. And someone else is like one. Very, very rare. It's like, no, nah, I think they're doing it in like a funny way. It's a little bit atypical. Do you know what I mean? Maybe they don't verbalize it super well, but they really do like look at their pattern of stuff they've done. They're clearly focused on outcomes. Someone else is like, no, I don't think they're thinking about that that way. They've just been kind of like lucky in the past, maybe with other people on their teams. And you can kind of debate and discuss. So when you think about like talking about like, hey, would somebody be good to work with? Would they do a good job? Would I like working with them? Or something like, where am I going to be more inspired and do better art? Rotterdam, Barcelona, or Berlin? 20, 30, 50 factors around that. You can pull out some that are interesting to you and create something like this. And there's other techniques like this, right? That you can use um, to do this. And that gives you just like a start of doing something kind of semi-scientific, right? You know, because if you really wanted to, you could look up like, hey, how many artists are there? in Barcelona or Berlin or Rotterdam or per capita or whatever, like you could actually like, you know, sit and like put numbers on it. If you really wanted to, you probably don't need to. Um, you can probably just on a quick subjective pass, but it lets you talk about things um, and make it viable. Um, two things, and then we can talk about setting up mental frameworks and do it a little more interactively. Um, I'll share all these notes. I wanted to wait until we did the snowmobile thing first, right? Um, As soon as like a new pattern of thinking becomes very common, it tends to get used poorly um, for a little while, right? Um, my kind of favorite go-to on this was, you know, Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers book, 10,000 Hours thing. The, uh, yeah, 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 <laughs> I see people smiling. Um, you know, I had an instinctive negative reaction to Outliers. I'm like, this is wrong and I can't explain why, right? And everyone else is like, no, it's great. It's the best. Things got a little bit easier for me to explain like a year later when the person that did the original research that Gladwell based his book on, Erickson, was like, yeah, you know, I did the research on deliberate practice. Gladwell didn't understand it and wrote the book badly. <laughs> like, this is like not in line. I like, he's basing this on my work and he's wrong. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Still sold a bunch of copies, right? So you see things like the, the excellent work that, that, that um, Erickson did on deliberate practice gets kind of misinterpreted in pop culture and is is junk right um analysis is extremely powerful uh, the word just kind of gets thrown around a lot right the word gets thrown around a lot and people do it kind of poorly as a result right it's been overused to the point of being a cliche right this is what we're talking about since the renaissance analysis has been the foundation of problem solving but it's not the only thing in the world. I'm not saying it's only analysis. So you want to do synthesis, right? You want to do synthesis, put things back together, right? And kind of say like, hey, like how would this come together? Would this work or not, right? Analysis is isolating the parts of something. And like a very, very, very correct objection is that like systems, right? Are not just the parts, right? Somebody could be like a great painter, a great communicator and very organized or like they could have great like skill at like color and perspective and whatever goes into painting they might be a good communicator they might be very disciplined and they might like not make nice paintings do you know what i mean so you can have all the like sub aspects of being a great painter and like not actually make good paintings like totally happens right um nevertheless the ability to like take things apart is good so this author here if i remember correctly is an engineer said, hey, take an automobile, take a car, right? If the engine's not running correctly, you could do analysis to say, okay, what's going on here? There's the fuel injector, the fuel supply, the fuel transport system, combustion chambers. Then you analyze and you say like, hey, which of these is not running well? And then you fix that, right? So, so a mechanic fixing up a car is literally doing analysis. Like, it's not like, probably it's not like everything in the engine equally sucks. It's probably like one thing that the, the fuel injector hose is set up wrong or this filter is in a bad spot or there's some rust here or this thing is ill fit, right? 
check, you know, and so you could go through all of this, right? Um, I know, right? Somebody can object, hey, you can't use analysis for everything. I know, but most people don't have the anal uh, formal analysis techniques at all, right? Most people don't have them at all. And yes, when you put them back together, you do want to look at the synthesis and see whether things come together. I'm going to systems theory. We're going to go a little bit. Uh, we're not going to get fully on systems theory. We could do a whole thing just on that. But I do want to acknowledge that, that that's a thing, right? Good analysis, like, will make you more adaptable, right? It lets you see the pieces. And, like, I'm not like, and that's it. Just get the pieces right and you're good. You know what I mean? You can make a list of 20 factors that are, like, really nice for a city, right? There's great public transit. There's some green stuff in the city, right? There's, like, parks and nature, right? The people are friendly, like, you're safe, right? The, the water's really clean. It's drinkable. It's affordable. Like, you can make that list of stuff. Then you can make a city that has all those things. And the city still just kind of is, like, underwhelming. Right. And then I say like Barcelona, which uh, I've been to Barcelona. I spent a summer there once. It was great. Like Barcelona doesn't have a lot of the stuff that's like, it's missing a lot of the stuff that's on like a very livable city list. Like there's like Barcelona, some serious, serious problems, but Barcelona is really freaking cool. Do you know what I mean? It is really, really, really freaking cool, even though it's got a ton of problems. Right. So it's not like just like analysis alone is the answer. Right. You could take a very boring city that has like a checklist of everything you'd want in a city. And it's just, for whatever reason, it doesn't get you going. And you can take Barcelona where it's like, careful around the water, be careful going out at night. Like, you know, people are gonna try to pickpocket you. I, I don't know how it is now. When I was there, you had to like really watch out. People try to rob you. And I did have somebody like try to mug me when I was walking, like very half-assed mugging attempt, but like it was, can I get your money? I'm like, no, okay, <laughs> right. But it was a little bit aggressive. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Right. I went to the camp and I went to the the, the soccer football stadium there. And um, like I paid with a 50 euro bill for something and the change should have been like 40 and change. And the person tried to give me back a 20, a 10 in coins. I'm like, no, two twenties. Do you know what I mean? Like, like that kind of crap happens there that, that wouldn't happen in like a Singapore or a Tokyo. And yet Barcelona is really freaking cool. Um, and it's beautiful. And there's like a lot going on there. That's like really amazing. So analysis alone doesn't do it, but in the absence of like analysis, like, hey, do we want somebody that's like, we put tough and likable together on this one because it's not like tough, like uh, hard ass. It's like, you know, those people that are like tough that like got your back, right? They're like, okay, we could do this. Let's get through it. We're looking for that, right? When we work with people, right? So it's like, hey, somebody might not be tough. They might be like a little bit sensitive, right? But they're very conscientious. They're a good roommate. They got some like wonderful poetics or something that's very nice about them. And like, how do you compare that? And then there's some other people that are like, I never quit no matter what. I encourage everybody. Let's rock and roll. But maybe they're not as outcome focused. They don't think about the downstream effects of things. And like, this just gives you like a framework to talk about it, this class of thing. And this sort of thing can be set up on everything. So the last thing I'd like to do together is I'd like to, to talk about this. And, and I'm very happy to analyze practical cases here's already one of them right i feel like collecting collecting stuff like this that you can use as mental techniques right last week we did last week we did statistical overconfidence underconfidence stuff if you were here if you weren't that's either on youtube or will be up shortly right you collect stuff like this right and it lets you think about the world more clearly it gives you more tools that you can use to make the world better. This one's a beautiful format. Four is a very, very wonderful one, not five. Four means you can't be like three on a five scale. You can't come in in the middle, right? So four is like strong against, like weak against, like strong against or strong downside, weak against or weak downside, weak endorsement or like weak good, right? And then like strong endorsement, strong good, right? This is a really useful thing that you can use to score things. Binary is obviously very valuable as well, true or false, right? So we could talk about this and how to do analysis and take things apart. Um, and that's what I'd be very happy to do for the rest of the time. Feel free to flip your cameras on if you'd like. Um, and then, yeah, what would we like to, what would we like to take apart, you know, around goal setting or problem solving or things of that nature, right? Um, to throw out another couple of examples, right? Let's say somebody wants to be quote unquote more creative, right? Let's say somebody wants to be more creative. Well, that's very abstract, right? Like, hey, I want to be more creative. Like, what does that mean, right? Well, you can turn that into, hey, I write down 
five new ideas a day, right? And at the end of the week, I look at my 35 plus ideas and I see which of them do I really like. And I try to come up with novel or interesting ones. You could even score your own ideas, like we just said, on like, would this be wildly creative? How easy is it to implement and things like that? So you can start using these techniques to shape things. I do know people that have used this type of thinking very successfully when they've chosen what city to move to or what job to take. It lets you think clearly about things. Um, so yeah, like what, what, what are people working on? What are the, uh, and I'll also take general questions, but like what are you working on? And we can think about how we can put together kind of an analytical framework on that to be able to then apply other techniques. And that allows you to use statistics and that allows you to use science related things, scientific method, the Norvig stuff that we talked about last week, right? So the ability when you take it apart and isolate factors, that'll let you use kind of scientific like techniques and be more rigorous about it. So yeah, what are people working on and or questions? And uh, yeah, we can explore together how to operationalize this and apply it. And so uh, feel free to jump off mute anyone. Uh, I might uh, warm you up, Sebastian, and, and let me know if this is not appropriate, this, this question. Um, but it's on my mind because Malcolm Ocean came to the STOA on Monday and I took his goal crafting intensive on, um, on the weekend. It was really cool. And I ended up just like designing a new goal system because mine was like, I didn't have one or it was needed to be updated. Uh, and so like a system that kind of like allows all the goals to be coordinated and know, you know how to prioritize and feel good about it. Um, and also allows you to deal with the uncertainty and pivot and all that type of stuff. Um, so I'm curious if you have any thoughts about designing a, a goal system to house all the, the goals uh, that one may have and using this approach to do so. Sure. So, I mean, there's a lot of different levels that that could be, that, that could be answered on, of course, right? Um, so I think, so here's an example of analysis that I think is, is very, very helpful. And you can kind of collect these, these little things over time and apply them, right? When you set a goal, talk about setting one goal for a second as opposed to system. We talk about system in a second. I'd, I'd like a little clarity on what would be most useful there because you know, we talk about a lot of things there. Um, I think a lot of people maybe don't explicitly realize that they could set a process goal or an outcome goal and radically different things will happen based on which one you set, right? Radically different things will happen based on which one you set, right? So if you say, you know, my goal is to write 500 words a day of any quality for writing practice. That's very, very different than I'm going to try to make a great piece um, every two weeks that gets accepted by a magazine or a publication or a, a popular website or gets some, some traffic. Um, you know, it's very, very different um, if, you know, you're a uh, you know, in some sort of a student coordinator role at a university, and you say, hey, we're going to throw a bunch of cool events, and like, we don't care what happens, we're going to make them as cool as possible, and then see what happens, versus we'd like to have at least 20 people attend, and then 10 of the people that come to each event come to the next one, and put like outcomes on it. And uh, process versus outcome, like there's not a right answer to that, right? They, they have like very strong trade offs. And a lot of in a lot of fields, people will default to an outcome, you know, an outcome basis and just asking the question, Hey, if we, if we set this as like, we're going to follow a process, right. That like, we're going to get together once a week, we're going to decide some stuff that's really good. And then we're going to do it as opposed to, we're going to have this goal, whether that be um, something numerical or, or financial or, or some, you know, discrete outcome, right. Or the other way around. There's a lot of fields where people are very process oriented typically. And what if you did switch to an outcome oriented thing, right? So if somebody goes from, you know, being an all around athlete um, with a lot of, you know, mobility and strength and stuff and they're training and they're following the process to I'm gonna enter in this competition, I'm gonna try to win. How does that change how you train, how you do nutrition, how you do periodization and all that sort of stuff, right? So being able to decide, hey, do we wanna process, approach this in a process way or an outcome way um, is, is very, very interesting. Um, another thing that's that's very amenable to using analysis on is different time horizons. Um, an interesting thing is just about all goals happen over time, right? And just about all goals 
when they fail, fail on some time horizon. So is it that like when you sit down to do something related to your goal or stand up if it's a moving around sort of thing, that you're unable to do something correct in that moment? Right, like you don't have some skill, or there's some you know emotional block. You don't feel comfortable with what you're doing, or is it something that on a day-to-day -day basis you have a hard time sustaining it because some days you're having a bad day. You want to go running in the morning, but it like snows where you live and it's snowy. So do your goals get busted up on a sometimes when a day is like not working for you, or is it like a week-over-week -week thing where like it's a travel or an illness thing, or is it like a sustaining thing over long periods of time? Right, so you could kind of study um, that and. Tying into what we talked about last week with statistics, um, I think a lot of people have very unrealistic base rates on goals. They don't know what the base rate of success or failure on a given goal is. And I think it's worth learning those, right? Um, there was a, a coach of Olympic athletes. He wrote an okay book. There's like some gems in it, but it's a bit rambly and digressive, but it's okay. Um, it's called Elite Minds. The best parts of the book are excellent. Um, and he said, you know, everybody's saying go 110%, blah, 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 in athletics is, is nonsense. It's wrong, right? He said, you can't go more than 100%. 100% is like the most you could physically do, right? Like, like literal 100% is like dying. Do you know what I mean? 100% of your athletic output is like you die. <laughs> do you know what I mean? That's the most you could do. That's, you know, you get stuck on Mount Everest and you give everything you got and you just barely don't make it. Once you get back down, right, and you, you, you fall over, right, that's 100%. And he said, so you can't give 110%. The reason the advice is give 110, give 120%, whatever, is because most people start to get very uncomfortable around 40%-ish, 50%. I'm going off memory here. But he said something like people get very uncomfortable physically when they give 40, 50%, right, of their theoretical max capability, right? Um, so when you say give 110, give 120 they're actually giving 50 or 60% of what they're capable of, of what their body's actually capable of doing, which is about right for training, right? So what he said was, hey, if you want to be an Olympic athlete, that's like you're going to compete, you're going to the Olympic Games, you're one of the best 20, 50 people in the world, and you have to have some, some prerequisites in place. If you're a gymnast, you can't be super, super tall and, and whatever, and you know, like whatever, there's certain sport specific adaptations, right, at the highest level, right? But he said, hey, to be an Olympic athlete, you're going to want to be giving 60 to 80 percent, right, of your max capacity. I'm going off memory, something like this: 60 to 80 percent of your max capacity every time you go out to train. And then, depending on the sport, you're probably training five times a week. And then this is really interesting. He also said this is what you target doing for your five days a week of training, but you'll probably miss or screw up five training sessions a month, and that's okay. That's still on Olympic level. Something like that. I forget the exact things, but he actually gave the breakdown of like, here's how many days you train at what percent of your intensity, and you're going to miss a few even when you're trying as hard as you can. And Olympic athletes miss days, right? So I think a lot of people get in athletics and they're like, I'm never going to miss a day. And it's like the person competing in freaking Beijing or Tokyo or whatever, like misses days and screws them up, right? And if your training is good on the other days, you're okay. So getting like correct base rates and analyzing that. Um I don't know if that's a complete answer to your question. What would be most useful on the systems basis around goals and having them like relate and interact with each other? Because there's a lot that could be talked about there. Cool. Yeah. And I think it depends on uh, what the context is and what the, the ecology of goals are oriented towards. Um, and then that kind of the input output thing, uh, there's a process outcome that you mentioned uh, that um, that resonated because uh, I know for my writing, uh, my journaling practice, uh, having the the process goal of journaling every day, and I do it at the stove. We have a collective journaling, so it's kind of like it's like a hack accountability. I have to open up the Zoom room, and we journal together in silence, sort of like an ultra working session. Um, and then I noticed adding an outcome goal of just one uh, publishing one entry a week added a certain like fire uh, added in the belly, um, and that was helpful for for this year for uh, publishing. Um, so I like this idea of being playful, and mindful of the relationship between two types of goals in the system. Yeah, and then a couple of just like a couple of like very practical, like these are like derivations of of analysis around goals. Um, probably a lot of people are thinking about it with it being January for habit based goals. Um, there's two ways I'll approach it. One of them is like 
or die trying or like hell or high water. Like I'm going to try to do this every single day and I'm going to be like fanatic about it. And if you do that, you have to like make sacrifice in other areas of your life and you have to plan and design around it, right? So if you're like, I'm going to meditate first thing in the morning every single day and I'm never going to break that no matter what. Well, like you need to set your alarms like sufficiently before a thing needs to come up and you need to like ask yourself the question if it's like a really crazy morning or like such and such is happening. Will I sacrifice that for my meditation habit if it's first thing in the morning or can I do it later in the day if that happens or whatever? So you're going to want to really think about it. If you're going to do one of those, I'm aiming for as close to 100% as possible goals. I very rarely like habit, habit based goals. I very rarely set those. I almost always set my habit based goals. Um, to target a 70% success rate on all the habits I want to be running. And if I'm above 70% and I review weekly, if I'm substantially above 70%, if I did 100%, I make my, my, my set of targets harder until I'm back down at 70. And if I'm way below 70, and this is tough. This is really tough for like achievery people that are like type A achievery, want to get a lot of stuff done people. Um, if you're below 70, then you make your goals easier until you get above 70, right? So let's say you say, hey, I'm going to go run five miles a day. And like, you don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Like you don't do it once in a week, right? A lot of people just like fail there, right? And it's like, okay, I'm going to like run a half mile. You do it once and then you don't do it the rest of the week. You're still way below 70%, right? You're like, okay, I'm going to at least go for a light jog, right? Around the block. You do that every single day. Then it's like, okay, I'm gonna go for a run around the block. Okay, I'm gonna run two blocks, and then you work and that'll keep you basically at the edge of your capabilities. It also like calibrates and corrects automatically if you get sick or injured or whatever, because you just keep downshifting um, until you're at equilibrium and, and you make it whatever. 70 is not magical. It could be 65. It could be 80. I like having more successes than failures. 70 is like, like little more than two successes for every failure, right? 66.6 .6 is two successes for every failure. Uh, I don't trust any social science research anymore until I've like checked it like four or five times with the replication crisis. But um, a while back, and it sounds credible to me, they uh, the the research suggested that that people get more bummed out by failures than they get pleased by successes. So I don't know; it's not really scientific, but something like a two to one ratio of successes to failures seems about right for me. When you target one hundred percent, you either need to be hyper conservative, right? You either need to be like hyper conservative to not fail or risk failing. And if you're like 100%, a lot of times people go off the rails when they're like, I'm going to do this no matter what. And then they don't, they break down. They're like, oh, right. It's like, this is like what happens with like binge, binge eating and dieting. Someone's like perfect for like three weeks. They have like one slice of pizza at a pizza party and then they just go off the rails and just like get out of control, right? So if it's like, hey, 70%, I'm going to try to eat exactly on my protocols, right? To this standard. And like, yeah, whatever. Like you, you can even like screw it up a couple, couple days a week. If you're never screwing it up, you can like gradually tighten them up and make them pretty hard. Um, if it equilibrates at 100%, that's like, that's fine um, at some point. But, you know, you can kind of keep in a, in a spot, the sweet spot for you. All right, we have um, a couple of things. Ty has asked in chat, how would you think about coordinating process and outcome goals? That's a big topic. Um, that is a big topic. Feel free to clarify, Ty, like what area might be useful for examples right well because... it is interesting uh peter yeah totally uh yeah, you know you gave your example with writing which would be actually pretty analogous to mine and um that was actually a pretty good example i think you said it like five seconds after i wrote it so um actually one thing i'm i'm finding actually is around like i guess balancing yeah qualitative versus like quantifiable things like I don't know, I'm, I'm sort of working on like output stuff. Like, you know, I'm, I'm doing like an annual analysis and it's not very much like an annual review of the year. And it's like, this is, I would not recommend how I did it. And it's like, this is this is subjectively very taxing, and very uncomfortable and uh, probably could have benefited from like a few, I was probably missing a few cogs or time resolutions of um, intermediate review at like the monthly and the quarterly scale. But in, in any sense, it's still valuable. It was just like a really heavy lift and like psychologically discouraging, I guess. You know, so the, the, quali the, the quality of the process. So I don't know, like aiming for a relatively frictionless process. I, I don't know, sure. those sorts of things. Yeah, I got a couple, I got a couple of thoughts. Yeah. 
Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts. The first one is something I think a lot about. So we design a lot of, of interfaces and technology and stuff. Something I think a lot about is you never want to cross over what I call the paperwork threshold, where engaging with your own systems feels like you're doing paperwork. You know, like if you ever go to like Department of Motor Vehicles, and you need to fill out like two extremely similar forms, but the boxes are different. Like the driver's license renewal form and like register my car form has like different boxes asking the same question. It's like, this is so stupid, but like, like you, you, you can get it for the historical reasons. Like there's a reason it looks like that, but it's like still aggravating. Like, why isn't this one form that, that inputs into both of the databases? Like, right. This is like stupid. Right. Um, when people are like filling out the same forms or similar forms over and over and over again, or there's just like a lot of information that you're processing and it feels like boring, that feels like doing paperwork. Right? That feels like doing your taxes, which like, I don't hate doing my taxes. I, I, I like numbers and stuff, but like it's not my favorite thing in the world, right? So you always want to make all your own systems not feel like doing paperwork. Um, so to, to give a small example, right? I think one thing that can be useful to do during a weekly review, for instance, um, is to look at all the impact areas in your life. How's my health? How's the physical environment around me? How are my relationships? How's my finances? How's my career? I think you can only have about seven to 12 items that you look at every week. More than that, and it crosses the paperwork threshold. And like, ironically, like I find when I've tried to put like 15 or 16 items down to look at, I actually look at like less than if I put like 10 and like did a nice job. I do like the first three or four and then I'm like, that's ah, crap. I don't want to look at like another 15 of these. And then I like skip it or, or, or go too fast, right? So keeping yourself to a place where you're not in the paperwork threshold and where the amount of like utility, whatever that is, whether that's, you know, calibration of like how difficult or hard should I make the targets or getting help or insight, or it's interesting. Like, I think there's, depending on how much you like sitting and crunching numbers and data and thinking about stuff and introspecting, the amount of like power that you get for like per how much work it is to do administrative stuff or analysis um, varies from person to person. Like the super quantified self geek, geeky people of, of whom I'm one, um, will do a lot of it for some yield. Uh, but for most people, it needs to be a lot of, uh, power and gain for, for every minute that feels like doing paperwork. But the more it feels like not paperwork at all, it's just like fun, um, the better. Um, as a well, my mind was almost entirely subjective and qualitative, which like lends itself not very well to any sort of, and it was like, it's all kind of feel. <laughs> and so like did not lend itself that well That's to and that's now. fine. No, that's totally fine. Whenever I'm doing something like that, by the way, if you want to make it, because without knowing all the details, it's it's hard to weigh in. Um, the thing on, on qualitative stuff that I always tell people to look for is look at look for the like outlier exceptional stuff and look at the outlier really bad stuff, right? A lot of people will like study everything that they've done, right? But like, let's say you did whatever, 100 pieces of writing, for instance, last year, right? Like what were overwhelmingly your favorite? And like, were there any that were like disappointing or a huge struggle? Like that's really most of the gains. If you had three or four pieces of writing that were like incredible, like spend most of your time studying that. Um, and then if there were a few that were like, man, I was really excited about this topic, but then it kind of didn't come out the way I wanted, then you can also look at those and, and try to see if there's a pattern there. Um, so, so being able to simplify that so, you, so it's not like, oh man, I need to study all these 100 pieces of writing and rate how good each one of them was. This is probably not enough juice for the squeeze there. If you did that on a weekly level, you're right. If you did that on a weekly level and then did like a roll up, weekly or quarterly or something, then it, then the friction is lower. Um, but yeah, that's, that's interesting and, and, and happy to go deeper on that. You feel free to put a little more in chat. Let's go through the rest of the questions, but then I'm um, happy to circle back if there's more that you'd like to do there. Um, Dali says, can analysis be used to solve family issues in a new business? Uh, maybe. Um, you can attempt to use it. Absolutely. Uh, is it going to work? I mean, that will really depend. Um, so whenever you're cooperating with other people, you need to find a common ground with them. And, and sometimes it can be tricky when one person's analytical and another person's not. I'll just say that outright. Um, it's an uh, unfortunate thing um, about our culture is that sometimes people think if you're being, uh, if you're doing analysis and you're doing it calmly and coolly, that you're, you know, cold hearted um, or, 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 or worse. Do you know what I mean? Right. So one type of analysis is, is called root cause analysis. So let's say, I don't know what your family business is, but let's say you have a bakery, right? And, um, you know, let's say on one day, um, the prep 
work was not done so that the next day you weren't able to make the good bread because it hadn't been pre-made or whatever right a lot of times people get really upset like oh you were supposed to do the bread no no you're supposed to do the bread oh like what it's like all right hold on a second let's look at the root cause here different people do the bread on different days it's kind of informal we don't have any formal way to know who's doing it or not we have no way to check whether it's happening so you can kind of like go deep and eventually identify those points some people are more amenable to doing that or not so i would say here let me actually give you the right answer to this absolutely you can use analysis to solve problems like you can you can identify like hey where did this thing go wrong where do we not get what we want what happened here i'm um, making it a lot of clarity should you use a really hyper analytical communication style with like bullet points and uh you know here are all the facts and premises and stuff it depends on who you're communicating with right so you might do a deep 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 analysis but then you know, if it's about, hey, like, how do we feel about each other? Are we like being kind to each other? Are we being thoughtful? Are we on the same team? Um, sometimes being hyper analytical might, uh, could seem like it's compromising or selling that out and, and you're, you're not going to want to do that. So I'd, I'd just be careful on the communication level about that, but absolutely you can do analysis to figure out like what's actually going on and what might be helpful. Ariel says, I'm also having writing dilemmas. How much to publish on my own platform versus pitching to existing? publications um cool uh relatedly to all of this one thing that's that's neat to do um is to sit down and write a long list of everything that might be helpful of doing it one way or another right so just off the top of my head right on your own platform like for instance on your own platform you can do whatever you want you can make it weird experimental cool um right? And that's not true on other people's platforms. Other people's platforms, you might get somebody else taking a look at it and editing it, which is like valuable to have an editor uh, put eyes on it. On your own platform, you can, you know, build more of a relationship with your audience. On another platform, you can meet new people um, and so on and so forth, right? Um, so making a list of all of those and then looking at that and saying, what do we want? Uh, what do I want right now? Um, there's a wonderful book um, called The Goal. It's about industrial engineering. It's about factories. And it was an uh, Israeli physicist, Eli Goldratt, um, that wrote it. Um, and uh, he was not a factories person. He was um, a physicist. And so he modeled factories in terms of waves and flows and things. He said that almost always when you want a particular thing, there's like one chief missing ingredient, right? So if you can identify what that is, sometimes it's two, but it's usually one, right? So like, let's say you do amazing writing, but I don't know you, so I'm just making this up as a writer in general. I've written a lot in my life. I've written millions of words. I like writing, right? So I, I can go from my personal experience. I'm not talking about you per se here. Maybe some of it is true. Maybe it's not. If you do really good writing, but you're a little bit inconsistent, then asking yourself, okay, if consistency is going to be the thing, which of these is going to lead to more consistency? Is that saying, hey, my thing comes out on my site every Thursday, no matter what, or is like getting into a... a ongoing cycle with Harper's or something going to be like, oh, okay, Harper's will, I got to call them there. It's got to come out every week, whatever, right? Like which one is going to help you be consistent if you're missing consistency? Um, if you're doing great writing, but there's like not enough people are seeing it, people really like it when they see it, but not enough people are seeing it, then like, yeah, maybe the external platform thing is better. Um, if you feel like your writing is, you know, if you were like doing, um, like a pretty good mainstream take on some something, but you want to do something um, a little more interesting, a little more weird that like is not a fit for academic publications or journal or whatever, um, then doing it on your own site. You know what I mean? Combining, you know, um, you know, in academic publications, they probably wouldn't blend like ecology, like, you know, ecosystems and the environment with like artworks. Like as far as I know, there's like nothing doing that. Maybe there is, but probably not. But you could start your own, you know, blog or website that's like art emerging from ecology or ecological art or something, right? So that's, you know, there's like art things, there's like environment, ecology things in the academic world. As far as I know, there's not one that blends them. You could, you could do that if it's on your own. So trying to say like, hey, what's missing? And then um, if you can identify like, here's the most missing thing for what I want, then uh, that can be very helpful. Um, and like, if nothing's missing, you know, it's like, hey, I'm just doing this to have fun, then just pick whichever one would be more fun. And I wouldn't sweat it too much. Um, something else I had pointed out, by the way, um, 
to me by uh, uh, a smart guy. Um, he said, hey, when you're really having a tough time um, with a decision, it's often because they're pretty close in value. So just make it move on. Sometimes there's like downstream implications of things, right? We're like, this is better right now, but two years from now, that's better. That I would sit and think about, right? A little bit. But if it's like, oh, should I do it this way or should I do it that way, right? Like I got invited to two events that are overlapping and like, oh, I really don't know which one I should go to. That means they're actually probably pretty close in value. If one option is way better than the other one, you pick it pretty quickly. So a lot of times people agonize on options that are pretty close in value to each other. So I'd, I'd consider whether that's going on. It might that might not be the case. It might be that there's trade-offs of different time horizons or you get different stuff out of it. But sometimes it's like, all right, let's just, let's just rock and roll. These are pretty close. Let me just pick one and get after it. Um, sometimes I realize that like things that are really close, I just, just pick one. Um, sometimes, other times not. Um, Mark says, military flight safety uses root cause analysis and the emphasis on improvement versus blame. And everyone commits this from the beginning. There are usually a lot of contributing causes. Yep. Um, yeah, I think that aviation um field in general has done an amazing job both military and civilian on like minimizing airplane crashes because they study every crash um and then yeah i think almost all the time coming at things as neutral as possible like i, I find blame is not really helpful you know you want to understand what happened and prevent it from happening again you know um dolly asked earlier hey can we solve any any issues in a new business that's a family business and it's like yeah sure right if somebody doesn't open up the shop on time or like whatever like 100 bucks goes missing from the cash register or whatever it's like double check that everyone's on the same team right everybody like wants broadly the same things cares about each other gets along right if not then maybe you should think about doing something else or or, or changing what you do right but if everybody's on the same team um, then yeah, it's like, we don't want a hundred bucks to go missing from the cash register. We don't want the shop to not get open on time. Let's just solve that problem. And it's not, uh, what you got wrong or, or, or what I got wrong or whatever. So yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And that's, yeah, that's cool. Uh, Shay says I'm working on selling scripts, getting a play produced sort of in the background of researching a new project. Would you say it's helpful to divide the day? Or more like, would you say how? <laughs> How would you say it's helpful to divide the day? How would you make the decision about how many hours to spend on each thing? There's a few things you can do, right? So I, um, So with, with things like this, right, we talked about uh, a little earlier, I said, hey, here's how we, we, we look at what attributes a person might have. Would we like to work with them? One, two, three, four. There's a couple of things you could do. There's actually like a very limited number of ways to do that, right? Like, like dividing up the day between two different things. Uh, there's actually like a very limited number of configurations. So here's one that you could do, right? You could say, I will not spend any more than X hours on one of these activities. So you will say, I will spend no more than one hour on one of these activities, right? Or you could do the opposite. You could say, I'll spend no less than one hour on one of these activities, right? So you could say, hey, I'm going to do absolutely not less than one hour of selling a script every single day. You know, maybe, maybe you, um, like the research more, or like it less, but, but a lot of times people are probably liking the research more than, than selling maybe, right? But you're like, I won't start my research until I've done one hour of sales, outreach, whatever. These are the activities that count. I will sit down until I get that hour. And then the rest of the day is up to me. If I'm flying, I can put in more. I can do two, three hours if I'm in a good zone on that. But like, here's the absolute minimum I will do is one hour a day or one hour on weekdays or whatever, right? Um, you could do the opposite. You could say, I'm going to try to put in, you know, as many hours as possible on that, right? I'm going to put as many hours as possible on the research as, as little as I can on the sales or the other way around. I'm going to put as many hours as I can on the sales as little as I can on the research. Um, and yeah, those are some options. So the not less than one hour or two hours or whatever targets kind of interesting. Another interesting one that can force a lot of creativity is I won't spend more the next amount of time. I'll absolutely not spend more than one hour a day doing sales. I'll do at least 30 minutes, but not more than an hour. So it's like, okay, 
Like, I'm not going to be stuck doing this all day if it's not the part I don't like, right? You know, or if it's the part I don't really like, but I only have an hour, right? Like, I got to be kind of efficient about it. Do you know what I mean? Like, like how do I get the most out of this hour? So I'll spend no less than 30, no more than an hour. So like, those are kind of the parameters, right? Um, to other stuff of like, are you a morning person or like a night person? Do you start with the thing you don't like or start with the thing you do like? Do you get some momentum first? Do you switch at lunch? Do you take a nap first? Those are like super personal things that are like a little bit trial and error and talk with smart people. That's like, there's no definitive right answer. That's like a figure out what works for you. I mean, there's like things that tend to work better than not, right? Like doing the hard thing first, doing the hard thing right away, like tend to be good ideas, but sometimes not. Sometimes people want to spend the morning. It's also like, what level of like cognitive engagement or creativity is needed for each one of those is the sales side like actually like really requires creativity you need to like research who are like producers or editors or, or finance people or actors or whoever you're pitching or selling or, or relating with like do you need to really like think deeply about that and like do a amazing creative work or is it just kind of like you grind through it right if it's like needs to be really really good and you're really good in the morning, then maybe you do it first. If it's like, yeah, whatever, you just send some emails and you just reply to some emails and stuff, then maybe you do it in the afternoon after you do your research and your your other work. Um, yeah, I hope that's helpful. But but I think sometimes setting a minimum or a maximum target on one of them can be helpful. And then, hey, the rest of the time goes on the other one. Um, a lot of times putting those um, strict rules around the part you don't like um, can be helpful. And that clarifies it. It's like, I've won the game. I've done my job around that if i've done this and that and then the rest of the day i can run how i like um cool yeah that's kyle. super helpful thank you oh my pleasure my pleasure um kyle says when self-assigning goals have you found profit especially from subjective relative goals as opposed to quantitative outcome goals in the latter case is it not best to leave such prescriptions to teachers let me double i think you're meaning profit metaphorically here as opposed to profit literally yeah okay so I'm profit from subjective relative goals as opposed to quantitative outcome goals Aristotle I, I think had like the right word on this which is like he said different degrees of precision are possible in different things <laughs> do you know what I mean right um, and that's like some old school stuff right so like is a movie good you can measure how many tickets a movie sold at the movie theater but you can't measure like how good a movie is you can measure the audience's opinion but like in this like is this actually a great movie <laughs> do you know what i mean and it's funny too right because sometimes people that like, go to a movie they really all like it a lot and then like 10 years later nobody watches that movie anymore and then sometimes there's movies that like it comes out and people are like, oh, this is okay. And then over time, people are like, oh, no, that's a really deep movie. I'm still thinking about that 10 years later from time to time. Um, so, you know, a lot of the really important stuff in life is qualitative, right? A lot of the important stuff in life is qualitative. And I think for, for very analytical and numerical type people, it's, that's tough. They don't necessarily like that that's true. Sometimes you can convert, right? Sometimes you can convert, um, qualitative things to numbers or scales if you really want to right um and right so there's like statistical concepts like accuracy and precision right and and um you know like do things map well to reality and like are we describing the right phenomenon right um sometimes just the question like am i extremely proud of XYZ thing I did will map really well to did a good job. Sometimes it will and sometimes it won't, right? So like the key is when you like have an idea and maybe I'll try it out that way, right? Like, does it actually work? So if you ask yourself, am I extremely proud of that piece, right? Now, sometimes like the artistic merit of something and the commercial merit of something might be a little bit different. So, so Shay was asking a moment ago about selling and producing plays, you know, um, you know, I, I used to write these long form uh, narrative nonfiction uh, historical essays. And sometimes my favorite ones would not be the ones that were the most popular. And that's like tricky. Like, are we going for popularity or, or commercial, whatever, or are we going for like artistic merit? And so that's interesting when there's tension between those, identifying what that is, right? And you can do analysis to do that. Like, hey, this is very sellable, commercial appeal. This is very artistic right? Well, like, what's the sweet spot? Like, the sweet spot is when you do something that's, like, really cool and artistic with a lot of 
commercial potential if that's also how you make your living, right? You take the movie like like Back to the Future, right? Like Back to the Future was like cool sci-fi. It was like funny. It was like stylish. And like it had a lot of appeal to the audience, right? And like maybe, I, I don't think anybody like hates that movie. Like that's like a nice movie. Do you know what I mean, right? So like, that's cool, right? And, um, you know, one of the spectrum, you got like the mass market, like, stupid action sci-fi that like nobody's gonna watch just like a bunch of explosions just like eye candy and nothing else right and then on the other hand you have like extremely weird experimental sci-fi that like you're not gonna like get shown at all and it's whatever and like if you care about the commercial side of things for instance then the sweet spot is like hey commercial potential above this artistic potential above that um i believe the term satisfice was um, from a, a behavioral economics professor. So something that can be very, very helpful is you set a minimum bar, right? Like, hey, whatever I'm doing in theater or art or business or design or programming or whatever needs to pay the bills above this standard, right? I need to make X thousand dollars this year or I need to sell X scripts at this price or whatever, right? And I don't care about any number above that as long as it's sellable, I want to make the best art possible, right? So you set a satis satisfice, like, like I'm satisfied at this level threshold. You make sure you reach that and you test every idea against that. So like a sci-fi about like quantum crystals that you can't see correctly in five dimensions that don't show up on the theater screen. It's like not... No, it's not going to happen <laughs> probably, right? Do you know what I mean, right? So like, okay, like what's the bare minimum sellable? Okay, there's needs to be like a relatable protagonist. It can't be just a gigantic ensemble cast or it can't be like no protagonist. Do you know what I mean? Like there's like certain things to make something sellable. And then beyond that, how do we like tell as cool and epic of a story as possible, right? So you can satisfy someone and maximize um, on another. Um, and then you asked at the end of that, is it not better to leave such prescription to teachers? I mean, yeah, it depends. Uh, so, so teachers and mentors, right? Um, I think to try to relate um, that, I, I think it's incredibly different when you're doing something that has known best practices versus when you're doing something new and experimental, right? So if you're a beginner at like playing piano, like a piano teacher can like teach you how to play piano correctly if they're good. Um, and they, they could be like, here's what you do. Um, on the other hand, if you're like already an intermediate to advanced musician and you're trying to create like a new style of music, you're like doing some weird like invent new musical instruments things and like people try to do this. It's like actually really cool. People that try to invent musical instruments, you know, a teacher at that point um, really is going to like share ideas with you and help sharpen your thinking as opposed to like be prescriptive. So I think prescriptive advice works well when there's like known best practices and the more it gets into an experimental and the more somebody like doesn't have any skill and there's like completely known best practices is like prescriptive like find the right teacher mentor sensei whatever and do like exactly what they say for a while like works pretty well and then the more you get into intermediate or advanced and the more you're on the frontier where there's like no right answers the more you want like a dialogue partner to shape it to evaluate ideas and stuff like that as opposed to being prescriptive and then it's a you know more of a collaborative exploration so like a great mentor or teacher changes at the um how much the domain is known and understood and, and and at your skill level when you're learning it right if you're doing beginner weightlifting and like you don't have any injuries and you're completely untrained like yeah you get a strength and tradition and conditioning coach who's good there's a few different styles of strength and conditioning you do exactly what they say they'll write out a program they'll say these squats these deadlifts do all of them report back if there's any like tightness or weirdness in your back or your hamstrings or whatever They'll teach you the form, do the form exactly correct. Again, if they're credible, strength and conditioning coach. If you're like trying to invent a new sport, it's like a combination of like paintball and soccer, <laughs> right? Like, I don't think somebody can give you a prescriptive. That's, you're kind of going by your own light there. You know what I mean? That's your own thing. Don't know if that fully answered the question, but hopefully so. Thank you for that. Pleasure. Peter, is that, have we analyzed and synthesized enough for today? Yeah, unless uh, anyone uh, has any questions, uh, feel free to pop off mute. If not, uh, we can close here.
um, awesome session uh, today, Sebastian. It feels like the actual stoa, you know, the uh, philosopher comes. Um, yeah, like I said, it was scintillating. Philosopher comes and then uh, you ask away and then you answer. So uh, any, any setup for next week, uh, Sebastian? So yeah, we will move, uh, we'll move eventually. You know, we'll move um, eventually from, you know, once we get towards the end of trying to synthesize and, and, and use some of the tools um, into qualitative stuff. I see different people um, attending. I see some, some uh, continuity, but different people. So I will prep accordingly with some, some recap materials. Um, but yeah, let me pull up next time. Yeah, next one's going to be fun. Yeah, next one's going to be fun is we'll talk about, you know, like, what's the point of philosophy? So I'll come and I'll do a little recap. But then we can also say, okay, hey, we talked in the very first one, session zero, like, hey, set some goals, but like, you know, like setting goals, having them be falsifiable and stuff can filter back. Then we're like, some tools last time, some tools this time. Um, next time, we'll take a look at like, okay, let's apply this to like, actually, like living well kind of start to put it together, um, take some of these intermediate, advanced, beginner, low, 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 high end of expertise thing, take those to put together for a good life. Yeah, next week's going to be probably the most uh, put it together practical one of all of them. So I think that'll be really cool. Definitely people should come. Don't need to have prior background. I'll do a little bit of a recap. Um, and then we'll do two weeks from now, we'll do the most experimental, ambitious, who knows if it'll work one, but, but next week will work. So like come to that one, if you want some, some good practical stuff. So uh, I would be delighted to see everybody there. Tell friends, tell other people at Stoa. Um, yeah, it's a delight to be here. Thank you for all the good questions and, and for all the problem solving. Thank you for the nice compliments. Um, and yeah, uh, yeah. Good luck and Godspeed with all of this. I will also um, put my, uh, my notes here. If people want to review those, I'll put those into chat and I'll share those with Peter as well. So if uh, if anybody wants to take a, a look at them, they're pretty simple and straightforward this time. But yeah, there was that. And then I'll, I'll share that link again with Peter so that he can accordingly disseminate that. Yeah, so yeah. And then sharpening the, the analysis thing, it's kind of like, you know, I was talking um, yesterday, we, we, we do internal training um, on, on analytical concepts and thinking and stuff, or sometimes very practical stuff every week um, at Ultra. We have an internal, internal team meeting once a week and yesterday was it. Um, and uh, I feel like a lot of these things are like, you know, you know, Pokemon, right? Where you like, you capture little, little things and they evolve and whatever. Yeah, so it's interesting, right? People who haven't played the game don't realize there's two different things. And there's like your Pokemon, like your, your collection of Pokemon, but there's also your Pokedex. It's like an encyclopedia. And when you like start playing the game, it has zero entries, right? After you've caught a particular Pokemon, you get an entry for like, here's where that Pokemon lives, what its height and weight, what its attacks are. And then you know a lot about it. So you can engage much more with it and, you know, potentially catch that type of Pokemon and engage with it better. I think these types of techniques around analysis and synthesis are like you can add them to your Pokedex, if you will, and then like just use them on future problems again and again and again. It just makes life easier. So the more you can like identify different things, it's like kind of like learning a foreign language. Like once you speak a foreign language, you can communicate with people in that thing. If you're sufficiently good at it, you can read books in that language. You know what I mean? You learn a mathematical technique, you can apply it. And I mean, thinking techniques, you would think would have some of the greatest leverage of all because you can apply them again and again and again to different problems. So putting those together like that can be very valuable so anyways thank you everyone for the time that we got to spend together appreciate it peter thank you as always and uh yeah i'll look forward to next week awesome thank you my friend uh awesome session and uh i really love uh, sebastian does it ultra working and when you listen to his internal systems were super cool and you came to the store two years ago he talked about that there so you can check that uh the ultra working ethos um and next up at the stoa <clears throat> The Stoa after Socrates. So uh, John Verveke is releasing this uh, a follow-up to the Meaning Crisis series after Socrates. Really high production uh, value uh, thing you can watch in his uh, channel. And the Stoa is like the official spot where we're going to be doing uh, conversation and practices that John recommends. So you can check that out every Sunday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. And the Zoom link is on the in the chat. So that being said, uh, Sebastian, everyone, thanks so much for coming to Stoa today.